What about our Lord Jesus Christ? Before he began his mission, Jesus Christ went to be baptised by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. There are many meanings to the baptism of Jesus. John himself seemed at first a bit confused as to why Jesus was being baptised, because John was preaching a baptism of repentance from sin. John said that it was he who should be baptised by Jesus. This is in Matthew 3 verses 14 to 15. We know that Jesus did not go to be baptised as a sign of repentance from sin. He didn't have to die to his old self because he was already pure and spotless. So what was the purpose of Jesus' baptism? Some say that Jesus was preparing himself for his ministry by being baptised and that we should follow his example by being baptised before our ministry. This gives us an example to follow, but does not actually provide a meaning for the act of baptism. There's more to it than that. The purpose of Jesus' baptism was to prepare the waters for our baptism. His baptism was not what the waters would do to Jesus, but what Jesus would do to the waters. By immersing himself into the waters of the Jordan, he made those waters holy. As we know, the waters of the Jordan, like all rivers, flow into the sea, and there they evaporate and fall as rain, to water the plants and animals. In this way, water is the source of all life on earth. Water ultimately gives nourishment to humankind through food and drink. At the molecular level, the water molecules that touched Jesus' body 2,000 years ago are still present here today. In fact, they have dispersed throughout the whole world in a hydrologic cycle, and they are in contact with us here and now, today. At our baptisms, the molecules of the waters we are being baptised in are the same molecules present at Jesus' baptism. So not just in a spiritual sense, but even in a physical sense, Jesus has made all of creation holy and cleansed us from the reign of death. When we are baptised, we are immersed into water and receive the Holy Spirit. But before the baptism, the priest dips a candle into the water to represent Christ, the light of the world, being immersed into the water to make it holy. The waters of our baptism thus make us holy. At our baptism we also receive the Holy Spirit who gives life. After his resurrection Jesus breathed on his disciples and gave them the Holy Spirit. The molecules of his breath are being breathed by us all today. This breath gives life and as followers of Christ we too have a duty to bring life. At the very heart of Jesus' mission is the liberation from sin and death, about destroying death, as in Isaiah 25 verse 8 and Revelation 21 verse 4. Destroying death and bringing about new life. He died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to die, and he rose from the dead to free us from death and bring us new life. His mission also encompasses freeing us from any actions associated with death. These are easy to recognise, and they include war, famine, disease and sickness. We can also include pollution in this list, because this too brings about death. Jesus is all about life, and having life to the full. Christ's mission was to free the world from everything associated with death. Where the head has gone, the body follows. Christ is the head of the church, and Christians are the body of the church, the body of Christ. Our mission is the same as Christ's mission, and so the Christian mission is also about life. Our role is to bring Christ's salvation to this world, and this includes delivering the world from sickness, from famine, from war, and also from pollution. Many times in history the Church has failed in this mission. In fact, there are many times when she has contributed to war and other evils in the world, but she has repented of these past mistakes. 
Our mission hasn't changed just because we failed in it in the past. It remains the same. We are to continue to do all that brings about life, and that includes doing away with pollution. One of the areas that we have sat back for too long and just let evil prevail is in the area of pollution. The church has done very little to curb the tide of pollution. So what can we do in practice to bring about life? Much of the pollution on earth is caused by first world nations, that is, the rich countries of the world. It is these countries that are producing the most power, consuming the highest percentage of the world's resources, producing the most waste, and as a result of all this, are causing the most pollution. This quote is from the PLOS One journal. The environmental crises currently gripping the planet are the corollary of excessive human consumption of natural resources. Indeed, there is considerable and mounting evidence that elevated degradation and loss of habitats and species are compromising ecosystem services that sustain the quality of life for billions of people worldwide. Continued degradation of nature, despite decades of warning, coupled with the burgeoning human population, suggests that human quality of life could decline substantially in the near future. Increasing competition for resources could therefore lead to heightened civil strife and more frequent wars. Continued environmental degradation demands that countries needing solutions be identified urgently so that they can be assisted in environmental conservation and restoration. Identifying those nations whose policies have managed successfully to reduce environmental degradation should be highlighted to inspire other nations to achieve better environmental outcomes for their own long-term prosperity. The way we live our lives has an impact on our environment. Rich lifestyles tend to be unsustainable lifestyles, but they don't have to be. Those with money have tended to use the Earth's precious resources and tended not to use them wisely. This excessive human consumption is not good for our global economy or even for local economies. People living in third world nations are living sustainably. Most of them walk to work, walk to school and just about everywhere. Their houses are simply made from local resources and don't require large amounts of fuel to keep them warm enough or cool enough. They buy locally produced food and other resources. Most of them never set foot into an aeroplane their whole lives. The rich nations, on the other hand, are generally not living sustainably. Many of us have personal motor vehicles, which we drive regularly, even for the shortest trips. We live in large houses, using valuable resources to heat or cool them. We buy food and other goods that are produced in other parts of the world. The manufacture of all these goods, houses and motor vehicles, uses a huge amount of natural resources. If we continue to live the way we do, then the greenhouse effect will continue until the atmosphere becomes uninhabitable. There is much that can be achieved by changing the industrial processes of our countries, but a huge difference can be made by changing our domestic lives, and that's what I'd like to focus on. The two aspects of our lives that are causing the biggest effect on the greenhouse effect are our houses and our cars. Now which of these two is greater depends on which co rich country you live in. For example, residents of the United Kingdom have a bigger impact due to their housing, whereas residents in Canada have a bigger impact due to their car use. But both are unsustainable, no matter which rich country we are discussing. On a daily basis, it is the heating or air conditioning of our houses that causes the biggest constant impact that our homes have on the environment, and the one that we have the most control over. The benefit of reducing our heating use is that we also save money on our fuel bills. So, how do we reduce the heating and air conditioning? Firstly, let's consider heating. The first step is to improve the insulation of your home. 
Add extra insulation to your attic. Get rid of all drafts around doors and windows. Close the curtains, or drapes if you're American, at night to keep the heat in and open them in the morning to let the heat in from the sun. If you don't have curtains, then use blinds instead, or get some curtains. Put on extra layers of clothing or blankets on your bed when it's cold. This is cheaper and more sustainable than turning up the heat. During the winter you shouldn't expect to dress the same as you do during the summer. In the depths of winter you should be wearing two or three layers of clothing indoors and should have two or three layers of duvets and blankets on your bed. The human body has its own natural adaption system to cold temperatures and wearing warm clothing helps but constantly moving from a cold to a hot environment and back is not good for the body. So if you're outdoors on a cold winter's day the body will adapt to the cold by regulating your body temperature and keeping you warm. If you then move into a hot house then the body will need to regulate again as if it were a warm summer's day. If you then go outside again then the body will feel the shock of the cold more severely with the result that you are more likely to catch a cold. So living sustainably is also living healthily. I personally keep my house at around 17 to 18 degrees Celsius during the winter and wear several layers. Also don't waste heat by having it on when no one is in or everyone is asleep. If your house is well insulated then you should be able to switch off the heating completely at night. Use a timer switch to have the heating come on in the morning before everyone gets up. As for the air conditioning, save it for those really hot days and keep it to a minimum. The same thing applies as to what I said for heating in that the body is already capable of regulating its own temperature. Our bodies can deal with hot temperature. When the house is empty it is very wasteful to have the heating or air conditioning on. There's no real justification for this. Here are some of the excuses that people have for this. Number one, they want the house to be warm for when they come home. Well the solution to this is simply to use a timer switch to ensure the house is warm when you get home. If the time you arrive home varies then either have the timer come on at the earliest time you think you'll be home or manually switch on the heating for the times when you are home earlier than expected. Number two, they need the house to be warm for their domestic pets. Well, dogs, cats and other mammals have fur to keep themselves warm. And if the house is well insulated, then they should be warm enough during the few hours each day when you're out. Number three, there is concern about pipes freezing. Pipes can and should be insulated to avoid freezing. If there's still concern about this, then set your thermostat down to one degree Celsius. Then they won't freeze. If some of these measures seem unreasonable or hard, then consider what is more important. The survival of all life on earth or your personal comfort. Attitude is important. A problem that we have in the rich countries is that we feel that we have a right to live in luxury. We think that we've earned this right simply by being rich, being born into a rich country or moving to a rich country. But the reality is that no one is better than anyone else. We are all equal, whether we are rich or poor. So it's good for us to ask ourselves, do I care about other people or do I only care about myself? Putting up with even just a small amount of discomfort is a worthy sacrifice to make out of consideration for others. Now let's look at travel. In these days of communication technology, there is less need to travel to work. Telephones, internet and video conferences mean that we can work from home a lot more. But if we do need to travel, then there are various options for transport. And, in order of environmental impact, they are, starting from the lowest, walking, cycling, public transport, private car, aeroplane. Walking is a natural way to travel. It is good for overall health, 
including dealing with digestion or breathing problems, and a natural way to keep fit and healthy. It is also good for reducing stress levels. Cycling is also a great and fun way to travel that keeps you fit and healthy. For myself, my main mode of transport where I live at the moment is public transport or transit. And during this time I can pray, I can check through and respond to my emails or send and receive text messages. I can also doze. And as a result, I am that much more alert during the day. I can also just zone out, daydream, ponder things over or stare out of the window. This is actually good for the brain because it's a time to just switch off. I myself can't read on the bus because I get travel sick, but when travelling by train I can read a book or do some work on my laptop. Driving a car is a stressful business. You have to be alert and concentrate on what you're doing. There can be a lot of interaction with other drivers and some of those interactions are not pleasant. I am often shocked about how people treat each other when they are behind the wheel of a car, what they say to other road users who are complete strangers to them. Also driving time is often simply wasted time. If you are travelling alone, the only productive thing that you can do is make or receive phone calls, but then this is also not recommended because it can cause you to lose your concentration on driving. Although the cost of travelling by car on a kilometre by kilometre basis can seem cheaper than public transport, if you also take into account the cost of owning the car in the first place and then add in all the ongoing costs such as maintenance, tax and fuel, then public transport is much cheaper by far, regardless of which country you live in. There are many alternatives to owning your own vehicle. For myself, I rent a car or van on the occasional weekend if I need one. There are also car cooperatives with a variety of options for occasional vehicle use. In all my 23 years of working professionally I've never had to commute to work by car and I've lived in villages and quite remote places in my life. So that's travel. Now I'd like to consider what we call the three R's and these are reduce, reuse and recycle. Reduce what you consume in the first place. Avoid the need for something new to be manufactured. If you do own a car then it's better to keep the one you have for as long as possible rather than buy a new one. The actual manufacture of a car is its biggest hit on the environment throughout its life. Cars greatly depreciate in value during their first few years. So it's also a better financial investment not to replace your car until you really have to. It is true that newer cars tend to be more efficient in the way that they consume fuel, but this is quite insignificant compared with all the other factors that I've just mentioned. There is a tendency for people living in rich countries to accumulate so much stuff, a lot of which is of little value to us. Many purchases are made due to good product advertising and marketing, or seeing what other people have, keeping up with the Joneses as we say. A good way to control this kind of spending is to keep a shopping list and to never buy anything apart from food unless it's on that list. Items should only be placed on the shopping list after some thought, and this avoids any impulse buying. Before buying a gift for someone, Consider whether it's something they really need or will use. If you can't think of any suitable gift, then give a gift token, a gift card or money instead. These are likely to be better received than an unwanted gift. Buy second-hand goods where possible. They are generally much cheaper. They are a way of reusing what someone else no longer needs, and they avoid stuff going to waste. Rich lifestyles tend to be unsustainable lifestyles. Rich people often waste their resources because they measure the value of a resource by what it costs them personally. An example of this is crockery. Coffee shops will give out free cups with a coffee, but it's better 
to take your own for filling up. Just consider how many coffee cups are used once and then thrown away in a single town or city. And why throw away your plastic crockery after a party? Those that are not broken can be washed up and reused. Essentially the message I'm giving here is to live frugally. Even if you have money, you don't have to constantly be spending it. Save it up for something that you really do want, or give it away to those who are more needy than you. Caring for the environment is very closely tied to caring for the poor. If people in rich countries were to reduce the amount of money that we spend on ourselves and instead give more to charity, then this would help to reduce the poverty of third world countries. As Mother Teresa once said, live simply so that others may simply live. Reuse and recycle are sometimes confused with each other. Often we talk about recycling things when we really mean reusing them. Reuse means simply using something again, either for the original purpose for which it was made or for some other purpose. A good example is a shoebox. These are a handy size to use to store documents or other items. Large yoghurt pots can be washed and used to store food or other items. If you bring home plastic bags from a supermarket, they can be used afterwards for wrapping sandwiches. But if they're dirty, then save them for general use. For myself, I keep my bread bags for sandwiches. Then afterwards I wash them and hang them up to dry for reuse. The majority of things that we throw away are recyclable. Make sure they are clean. Most cities, towns, villages and communities provide recycling services for their residents. But if they don't, then you can request that they do. Now recycling is actually breaking down an item and processing used materials into new products to prevent the waste of potentially useful materials, to reduce the consumption of fresh raw materials for manufacture of new goods, to reduce air pollution from incineration, and to reduce water pollution from landfilling. Thank you for listening.